Welcome to the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast. 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 Welcome to the Eating Disorder Recovery Podcast with me, Dr. Janine Anderson. Heads up, this show may contain adult language and may mention specific foods. If you find either of those to be too triggering, I trust you to take care of yourself and do what you need to do. Hello again, friends. Thank you for joining me for part two of our two-part interview with Dr. Anita Johnston. Dr. Johnston is the author of Eating in the Light of the Moon, which if you haven't read that, you should get on it. She's also a licensed psychologist, a certified eating disorder specialist, a speaker, and a consultant. With over 30 years of clinical experience, she is a leader in the field of eating disorder treatment. She is the director and founder of IPONO Eating Disorder Programs and the IPONO Residential Program in Maui. She is also the chief clinical consultant to the Eat Fed Program in Sydney, Australia. Without further ado, let's get into our interview. We all have stories, and and oftentimes there's stories that we told ourselves when we were little, Mm -hmm. and we never fact-checked. We never went back to revisit them. Um, and so we continue to live our lives as though they're true. And our brains, when we're little, are, aren't, you know, developed. I mean, um, the frontal lobes don't even fully come on board until you're in your mid-20s. And that's the part of you that does abstract reasoning, can see cause and effect, right. um, can, can, you know, look for the consequences ahead of time. Who knows this? Car rental companies, <laughs> right? <laughs> and anyone who's lived through that period in their twenties, where you look back and you say, "No, I really am wiser now." <laughs> yeah. Well, parents of teenagers, right. they they reach for the milk carton in the fridge, empty. Wait, <laughs> who puts the milk carton back in the fridge empty? Yeah, uh, teenagers, no frontal lobes. Yeah. So, so we have all these stories that we told ourselves that, um aren't true. And and they may have been the best story a three-year-old or five-year-old or 10-year-old or 15-year-old could have come up with given the structure of your brain, Yeah, but they're not true. And we have to go back and revisit them mm-hmm. to say, wait a minute, mm-hmm. you know, is it true that my parents got a divorce because I was not fill in the blank, loving enough, good enough, smart enough, thin enough, pretty enough, you name it. Scarcity mentality. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and thinking that when bad things happen, it's your fault, you mm-hmm. see? So, you know, here's, and this is where it really gets interesting because you can start to see how we're creating eating disorders as a culture, mm. uh, it, and not maybe even intending to, this is what's so horrible about the war on obesity because here's yes. how it works. This is the way a little kid's brain works. Because the frontal lobes are not fully on board and they get very literal in their thinking, they get paralogical. And it goes something like this. Bad things happen. I feel bad. I must be bad. Yep, I am bad. I'm bad. That's Mm -hmm. it. And so um, mommy and daddy got a divorce. It feels bad. I must be bad. Mm-hmm. And the cause of the divorce until later that you revisit. And the, and even Freud understood this. You go back and you revisit old memories and you reconstruct and say, well, no, there's a thousand and one reasons mommy and, got, and daddy got a divorce and none of them have anything to do with me. Right. Frontal lobes, you can do that. So, but here's where it is tricky. This is, this is the tragedy. Uh, all the well-intentioned policies on this war on obesity, it's, it's horrific because... You've got this little kid saying, bad things happen. I feel bad. I must be bad. Now you live in a culture, a cultural soup that says fat, fat is, is bad. Yeah. Well, I would even ex- say anything except very thin and very yes. fit right now yes. is bad. Yeah. But even fat food, no fat, long, low mm-hmm. fat, non-fat, fat, 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 fat is bad. So, you know, a, a, if a kid then sees fat on their body, 
you know, they, they think there's something wrong with them. And again, here's the way a kid, this is what we're seeing. Seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds with eating disorders. Because the way their brains still are working is bad things happen. I feel bad. I, I am bad. Um, bad things happen. I feel bad, fat. I am bad, fat. Because they're linked. Right. Because the Christ says they're the same thing. Right. So this is why, this is like, it, it's horrendous what's happening in the schools and, and in you know, at the public policy level because they don't understand the effect this is having on the children. Sure. And just even in this well-intentioned effort to promote health, how when we do that in this way, it really increases the risk of eating disorders, which are incredibly dangerous disorders that people really, I think, minimize right off. That's what my dissertation was about. Mm, mm. But I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, this culture that we're setting mm, up because mm-hmm. I think we cultural overhaul. We need to recover <laughs> how we talk about our bodies and, and food for sure. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when you were saying that, I was thinking back to... So my eating disorder started really young in mm-hmm. middle school. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was thinking back to, I clearly remember the first time I ever thought of that. And I, rem- I remember mm. that day. It's mm. vivid. It's like mm. one of the few memories that I, so it was important, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember I was this cute little eight-year-old kid wearing a little flowery turtleneck and some hunter green leggings and some kids running across the playground back from race. Mm-hmm. And looking down and seeing my thigh jiggle yeah. Yeah. as I was running and thinking, I'm fat. And that was the mm-hmm. first time that I remember thinking that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. one of the most powerful things that ever happened to me in therapy, I worked with a wonderful therapist during my recovery, who the building that we met in um, was near a school. And so we walked out of the therapy room one time mm-hmm. and there were kids on the playground. And she was like, that's how old you were. Look how little they are. Look how tiny they are. Tiny, tiny little humans. How are you supposed to handle that? So I'm thinking, you know, as a woman who grew up in in Colorado in America, who's younger, and you Mm -hmm. grew up in a really different culture around food, and there was, you told me there's no diet culture. And to me, I can't even, (laughs) I can't imagine it. I can't, which makes me sad. But tell me a little bit more as for you growing yeah, up. Yeah, I, I, I think that's probably why I never did get an eating disorder because mm-hmm. I have all the attributes, the, the, the emotional sensitivity and the, the uh, keen intuitive nature. And typically that's a setup sure. uh, nowadays. And so I've, I've really been curious about this. And, and I do think it's because, so I grew up, first of all, uh, on a little island, Guam, in the 50s and 60s. Mm-hmm. So um, my mother did not ever diet. I don't ever remember her friends talking about diets. I, I didn't even know about dieting mm-hmm. uh, as a kid. It just, mm-hmm. I wasn't exposed to it. Um, then there were, um, the media influence was pretty limited. We had, uh, one TV show, black and white. We never watched it. It was, I mean, we didn't, you know, <laughs> we'd rather go outside and play because there was nothing interesting. Um, the, the magazine had, so, so the images we were giving, we had 17 magazine. Oh, there might have been Ladies Home Journal, that kind of stuff. There wasn't a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, Back then, the body ideal, this was before Twiggy. Mm -hmm. Um, So the body ideal was was quite voluptuous. Um, So there was a few things about having a small waist. We had, uh, well, there's Betty and Veronica, cartoon characters. But we knew nobody looked like that. We knew, you know, we were cartoons. Nowadays... Um, every image most girls are exposed to has been photoshopped, so they don't even know. Fake. Like photoshopped beyond yes. recognition. Yes, but but they don't know that. Mm-hmm. So all these images. Um, so um, I I think that's why I didn't get an eating disorder. That there wasn't this press. Now, um, that's not to say that the culture alone causes sure. eating by itself, but it sure does a good job of targeting those that might be most susceptible. 
Right. And, and so you kind of get, you know, um, a, a couple of things going on there. You get a certain kind of personality type. You might throw in a little bit of genetics right. uh, to the mix. If you want, you can add trauma. That 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 can help. Mm -hmm. But then you have all within this, this cultural soup that has unrealistic ideas about what a female is supposed to look like. And not only that, not we're not even given information that would that would help us. Like like you know, girls aren't being taught that right before they get their first period, um, they need to put on a substantial amount of weight because the body needs a, a, a certain amount of fat to process the progesterone that's going to yeah. jumpstart their period. Right. They're not taught. Right. You know, so when, when all of a sudden their body morphs, they freak out. Right. Uh, and then if they were surrounded by family members or, or friends that, that say, oh, Oh, I I better go on a diet. I I I I my butt looks too big in this dress. Or their family members are dieting. Or dieting. Yeah. 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 So now it's kind of bizarre that diet mentality has become the norm. I think it's so strange. It's very strange yes. when when you know when you pull when you zoom back and go, "Well, wait a minute." Years ago, interesting book by Kim Chernin called The Obsession, which uh, caught my attention because it was so intriguing. So, it, you know, she she does in this book, she shows a parallel process of when the women's consciousness movement was starting. Mm -hmm. It was the very same time all the diets came on board with, with watchers and, and all of those. So it was, it's an interesting concept. Yeah. If you think, well, wait a minute, is there a connection here? Now, I don't know for sure that there's a connection, but I certainly find it compelling that at, with the, the, uh, advent of the women's movement, trying to help women find their space and their place, there's this whole other movement to make them smaller, 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 smaller. Right. And, and what happens with diets is you get so obsessed with, with eating and food and weight that you don't even get to develop your curiosity and, and these gifts that you've come to, to, to bring. So it's, it's certainly worth looking at, I think. Right. <laughs> and I'm curious about it at the very, at the very least. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, something I've been thinking a lot about lately, too, is that I feel like the diet culture not only, I think, really can be a huge precipitant of the start of the eating disorder, mm -hmm. only doesn't make it easy to recover mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And something I wind up talking to people about is that I actually think that recovery and eating more intuitively rather than from a diet framework, and we'll talk a lot more about what intuitive eating means on the podcast and in other episodes too, but I think cover is actually a really counterculture, rebellious thing to do yeah. with the way things are. I, I think you're right, and, and I think... Um, in the beginning there, you need a lot of support and mm -hmm. fortunately there's a tribe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's a tribe of women who are getting this and which is why I created the light of the moon cafe online right. because it is a place for these voices to be heard and this support to be given as an antidote to the cultural press that is so full of nonsense, um, that when you step back, it's unbelievable, but because it's hard to step back, right. um, you start to feel like, oh, well, maybe I am overreacting. Maybe I am a weirdo. Maybe I am too sensitive. Maybe I am, you know, making too big a deal out of this, like everyone is saying I am. And it's, and so when you get that kind of support, um, it's, it's important. Right. Right. I think that that's a really important point in your real life and your online life, mm -hmm. your social media mm -hmm. life to be surrounding yourself with people who are on the same page with mm -hmm. you and really mm -hmm. are about body acceptance yes. and not even just, I, I feel like it's, that becomes the focus. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that I think makes envisioning being fully recovered so difficult is when you're in an eating disorder, you're spending so much time thinking eating disorder thoughts and thinking about food and all the numbers and whatever that you can't even imagine what right. you would be thinking about right. if that right. obsession. Yeah. And not just with an eating disorder, with a diet. Oh, sure. Okay? Anyone who's been on a diet, what do you think about all the time? The 
food and 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 the foods you're not supposed to be eating i mean it's 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 a trap a, mm-hmm. a big trap and so to be exposed to people that are doing creative things with their lives that their whole focus isn't what they ate that day or what they're going to eat right um is like oh okay so that's interesting Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well thank goodness there are people like you (laughs) out there to show us that you do about that at all what do you think is so scary for people about letting go of a diet mentality Well, I think the first thing is they're afraid they're going to get fat and fat is bad. Right. Okay. So right there, that's, that's kind of the message from the culture. But again, if you, what the function of an obsession is, Mm -hmm. what the function of an addiction is, it is to distract you from feelings that are either too overwhelming, too painful, Right. too scary because you don't know how to deal with them. Now, we live in, along with this diet mentality culture, we live in an a emotionally illiterate culture. Right. So <laughs> we're not taught how to identify, accept, no. and express our feelings. Now, the primary function of dieting and eating disorders is to keep you from being aware of these uncomfortable feelings that you don't know what to do with. That's its function. Right. Right. To not feel those painful feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I think why, first of all, the research is totally clear. Uh, Diets don't work. Right. We're going to have guests on later to talk about that (laughs) in depth as well. (laughs) Yeah. And, and they cause weight gain. So it's, it's amazing that nobody knows that. It's amazing that they denial about that because the function of the dieting and the eating sort of is to keep you in denial because um, we aren't taught that emotions are waves. They're, they're waves of energy right. that flow through us if we allow them. So what if someone stops dieting, and they've been using their dieting to keep these feelings at bay, those feelings are going to start to come up. And 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 typically what happens if someone's been dieting, they start throwing food at those feelings, and they start binging on all yeah. kinds of stuff. And, and it's due from two things, uh, the deprivation in the body, sure. but also the pushback from the psyche of going, oh, no, 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 we can't handle this. This is too much. We, I don't want to feel this. So we got to we gotta numb this stuff somehow. We got to stuff it somehow. We got to do whatever we can because we're not taught the skill set for riding those ways. And I think with the eating disorder and with dieting, it the denial causes you to forget waves come in waves go out like that's what we know they They will come but they always go away too and that that's not permanent yeah positive ones as well as negative sure yeah try try to hope you know it's like Mm -hmm. you can't do it um but that doesn't mean they can't come back and that doesn't mean that you can't get the hang of riding them and surfing them and and because when the big set comes in and it does for all of us. If you're on this planet any length of time, you're going to experience the loss of a loved one, social distress, medical crises. Right. It's the human experience. And it's going to bring up a lot of emotions, big emotions. And if you have learned how to ride the smaller ones, you're going to be all right. Right. But if you're, if not, you get slammed. Right. 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 I was listening to another podcast um, Rob Bell's podcast, the, uh, the Robcast, and there's an episode where he's interviewing another person. I think it's Pete Holmes who's talking about um, thinking about things um, from a little bit more of a distance and seeing mm-hmm. things as, oh, I'm in a set right now. Mm-hmm. Like when life is really mm-hmm. pounding, to be able to have some some distance from that and be like, I'm just I'm in the middle of a set. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. just getting yeah. pounded. It's yeah. gonna and it's gonna go away. Yeah. You can trust that. Yeah. But while you're in it, it's really hard. Yeah. And I think that's part of the distortion is thinking of, about it as a permanent mm-hmm. thing. Even worse, it's I mean, you know, in the islands and Guam and so for me the metaphor is if you had a boogie board 
And you went down to the ocean and you yes. held it up in front of your face, facing the <laughs> waves. What's going to happen? You're going to get slammed. And this is mm-hmm. really what people try to do with eating disorder tries to do, is try to block those feelings from coming in. And, and they're, they're waves. They're bigger than you. But you can ride them and mm-hmm. be just fine. And in fact, even have some fun. Oh, so much more fun. Oh my goodness. Sometimes I think about, well, we should have, we should have recovery is awesome. And one of the primary reasons is that because life after is so much more fun. So fun. So much more fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about your Light of the Moon Cafe and and how that started and what it what it is. Well, it it started um, so, and I still do soul hunger workshops around the country, but I could you know only be in so many places. And then um, there was a, a a dietitian Elizabeth Peterson in Virginia, and she had come to a workshop retreat that I do in Hawaii with um, Carolyn Costin and Francie White called Tending the Four Eating Disorder Professionals. And we pretty much, it's a very, it's not your regular kind of training. Uh-huh. We work in women's circle. And she came back from that and said, oh my gosh, I want to do more women's circle. And I said, okay, I can tell you how to do that. And so she started um, doing eating in the light groups in Virginia. And, um, no one ever wanted to leave. So she had five of them. <laughs> and so we get together and started talking and said, well, you know, how, how it, would it be possible to create women's circle online? Is that really doable? Yes. And we said we didn't know, <laughs> but we spent a year putting together um, this program. And so it, it consists of audios with my storytelling and interpretation and metaphors and um, uh, there's, um, it's follows eating in the light of the moon. So one day might be reading a chapter. Let's say this week you're reading chapter seven. Poems. Um, we have playlists for people to listen to. Yeah. Um, and there's a forum and, uh, there's also downloadable PDFs and, um, writing and drawing activities all designed to get to the underpinnings, what's underneath whatever the eating difficulty and, and, and then there's, it's, there's a forum, um, which is really cool because we have women from all over the world on this forum and, and it's not, you know, it can be three o'clock in the morning and if you can't sleep, you can go to the forum and see what everyone wrote about this poem. Right. Cause um, someone else is up for breakfast. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't have to be live. It's already been posted, Oh, wonderful. you know, so, you know, and so let's say, um, uh, somebody posted something on the story from three weeks ago, you'll get a notice in your email box saying, Hey, there's a new post, check it out. So you, it, it's very fluid That's in that. Great. Only one rule for the um, forum and that is only support, no advice. Yeah. And thus far, no one's broken that rule. Cause I'm on there all the time. I, I get to read stuff and I comment from time to time and it's really, mm. it's way cool. So it sounds awesome. It's, it's a lot of fun. Say a little bit only support and no advice. Why that's important. Because when women gather in circle, um, we're, there's no experts here. We're, you know, we're yeah. just sharing from our hearts, from our soul, our experiences. So you can say, hey, this really worked for me. You right. know, that's not the same as saying you should do this. And no advice because we all hate advice. Um, you know, it's like when you're in pain, the last thing you want is somebody to tell you what to do. Yeah. Um, you want somebody to understand. I remember a time, I, I don't remember what I was upset about, but I... I had called a bunch of people and everyone's saying, well, why don't you do this? Or yeah, no, no, no. I tried that or that doesn't work. I mean, I had all these reasons why not to follow the advice. And then later that night, my best friend finally got back to me and, you know, I told her what was going on. She goes, oh, don't you hate that? I mm-hmm. just hate that when that happens. And it was like, all of a sudden it lifted and, yeah. and I could get very clear about what I needed to do because somebody understood it. Mm-hmm. Somebody got what I was going through. So mm-hmm. that's a that's a, an important part of, of women gathering in circle. Right. Is to just be there. Right. So I'm wondering if I can just ask you for one more story <laughs> in wrapping up today. Be a good one to possibly end with, which is 
I would love for you to talk about fate and destiny. <laughs> that is maybe my favorite story of yours. And it's so important for recovery. So this kind of reflects about what we were talking about earlier with that we are um, gifts and they're mm -hmm. the gifts we're born with and, and, and our talents. And they're also the gift we are to give. Mm -hmm. But we're also born with fate. So if your destiny is what you are, you know, you've come here to, to do and be towards fate is the stuff that you're given that you didn't ask for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're pretty focused on the fate a lot of the time. <laughs> because it's the easiest to see. It's mm -hmm. real easy to see what your fate is. These are your parents. This is your ethnicity. This is, you know, your uh, socioeconomic right. environment. This is the car accident, yeah. the trauma, uh, the, trauma the eating disorder, you know, that that's fate. Mm -hmm. And, and they say in ancient mythology, if you don't face your fate, you'll never be. Mm -hmm. But the cool thing is, is that when you're trying to find your destiny, which is hard to find, it's buried right beneath your fate. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, I mean, you know, for yourself, right? You know, here you're living your destiny, right? You, you, oh, right I'm working now. hard on it. Sometimes yeah. I'm, I'm pretty yeah. intimidated. Yeah. But yeah. here you are, you've got a podcast. I know. You know, it's your destiny because it. when you're, when you're doing your destiny, everything goes ding, 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 ding. I know. Uh, yeah. I but think look at the open fate. The <laughs> look at the fate that teed you up. That mm -hmm. set you up an eating disorder recovery podcast. I know my my <laughs> eating disorder is definitely mm -hmm. on the path to destiny. Yeah, because you faced it, right? You see, and so it's sort of like um, uh, it gets your attention, and if we could understand that right there beneath it. So the metaphor I use is is if you're, and, and again in Hawaii, a lot of times people walk the beach with these metal detectors yeah. and all of a sudden it goes off and it's like okay dig there dig, dig there, there because there could be treasures yes you don't have to dig up the whole beach mm, <laughs> i know we should put that on t-shirts yeah. dig there about recovery well yeah because whenever you're having the urge to binge or purge mm -hmm. or restrict or yeah. diet or whatever it is that's a signal that from a part of yourself that's saying okay something here that's trying to get into your awareness mm -hmm. what be mm -hmm. because then what what happens is you start to see that eating disorder recovery is a path to consciousness yes and how cool is that it's to have so your own cool. inner gps yes if you could if you could understand i mean who who likes to hear recalculate re <laughs> but really that is what it's doing. It's signaling you when you're moving away from your destiny mm. rather than towards it. You'll, mm. you'll want to binge or purge or restrict or diet or whatever. It's a signal. Oh, 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 you're going in the wrong direction. But we right. don't realize that. Right. right. So the eating disorder itself is part of the fate the hard mm -hmm. stuff that oh, yeah. was handed to you that yeah. you have Who to Who asks for an there. eating disorder? Nobody. Seriously. <laughs> uh, and even that's another thing is, you know, when people get started on, on that path, you don't realize what that's going to turn into mm -hmm. until it's too mm -hmm. late. Oh, crap mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At yeah, some point. Exactly. Which is also a blessing, I think. That's a big sign. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was delightful to hear all of your stories and your insights. Thank you so much. So much fun. And we can find you if listeners want to connect with you at Dr. Anita Johnson. Yes. Best place to find and you. Light of the Moon Cafe. Light of the Moon Cafe. Or Ipono, A-I-P-O-N-O, -O, Maui.com. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Anita. Thank you. me for another episode, let's keep in touch. You can find all the information you need about the podcast at eating disorder recovery podcast.com, including full podcast episodes and links to all of our social media sites. You can join our Facebook group for the podcast by searching eating disorder recovery podcast on Facebook. 
This is a closed group for listeners of the podcast looking to connect, share resources, and get involved in a pro-recovery community. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Please leave us a review and let us know how we're doing. Talk to you next time on The Eating Disorder. This podcast is produced by me, Dr. Janine Anderson, and Elise Barbuck.